I'd really like to thank everybody at Ari here for uh, for um, you know uh, for for hosting me here. You know, I kind of came. I'm on a sabbatical leave, and I've been traveling through different places in the southern hemisphere. Well, just New Zealand and Australia, just the oceanic part of it. And uh, I must say, the welcome I've had here has exceeded uh, everything else put together. So it feels very comfortable and very wonderful to come here, and that's made me very 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 happy. And, Okay, yeah, we do have that up there. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about can we reduce our dependence on herbicides for cropping? And the, Mar Mark is right. This, this almost triggered, dare I say, an existential crisis in myself. You know, I've been working in this area for decades, and I thought, well, have they? You know, like, has my work made any difference at all? You know, that's kind of the... You know, the academics, uh, you know, I'm assuming most of your students are in academia. That is, you know, you do want to make society a better place at some point. You hope that you're not just uh, studying, you know, the spatial pattern of, you know, of what, of, uh, you know, linoleum or something, you know, and writing papers on that or finding alternative uses for sealing wax if I can misquote the, the Rolling Stones, that, uh, that we're actually doing some good. So hopefully we can uh, discuss that. So let's start off, I'll have a little brief introduction of me. And mo firstly, where am I from? And uh, this, is a, this is a headline from some years ago at the, in 2004, I guess it's almost 20 years ago, in the, in, when, people, when the newspapers used to exist, or broadsheets they call them here, right? Yeah, uh, uh, and uh, at that time, Saskia the, the coldest place in the planet was in Saskatchewan for that one day, and it made it uh, made uh, and, and it did occur actually at a chemical at, at, a, at a uranium mine in Saskatchewan is where it occurred. And Saskatchewan is much like Western Australia, and that we have, in addition to being an agricultural place, it's also a place where people dig stuff out of the ground and sell it and sell it to places around the earth, where they then take it and make it into things worth a lot more money than what was dug up out of the ground. But that's how it works. So Saskatchewan, oh, do I have, is there a pointer here or can I use, oh, there we go, can I, here we go. This is Saskatchewan right in the middle. So it's easy to draw, but hard to spell. Uh, we're at the, we're, it says trapezoidal province. The south part is cropland and this north part is forest. And this is where all the mining, mining and stuff. But we're concentrated on the south part. We're at kind of the, we're in the northern part of the, of the, of the Great Plains of, of, West, of, uh, of North America. As you go further this direction, it tends to get more arid because it's closer to the mountains and there's a rain shadow that happens there. But as you go this way, it gets more wet. So there's about 30 centimeters total precip down here and about 50 up here and about 60 down here in Manitoba. So it, it ranges, productivity ranges a bit. Uh, but that, that's essentially the geography. We're, of course, much further north. It's colder, as I said, et cetera. I've been, most of my life, I've been, I didn't know what to call myself. I had done essentially kind of a, weed eco a PhD in weed ecology. I did a bit of computer modeling, tried to integrate ecological theory. That was very popular at the time and, um, and, um, and did that. So, but I was hired as an agronomist because they already had a weed scientist where I was. So I kind of worked my way into what I call, termed myself as a weedy agrologist. And in the last few years, I've become much more to digital agriculture, as I said before. But so we're trying to talk about today, can we reduce our reliance on herbicides? And a lot of my early work was on organic. And I'll show you that because that was kind of the ultimate system to reduce herbicides on. Because to be honest, when I got hired, HD crops were adopted in Canada, while well, wheat wasn't, but, eight, but there was herbicide tolerant canola. And there was this idea amongst uh, people and amongst funders that, well, you know, we, you know weeds aren't going to be an issue anymore. We have, you know, Roundup Ready this and that and everything. So it was actually hard to get work for that. De herbicide development in companies was just dropped, essentially. They kind of just ran with what they had. So things, it was a bleak period for weed science as a discipline because it looked like we had finally control of weeds, but we found out that wasn't true. And, you know, here in Western Australia, of course, I would always, when I was, when I was lecturing to students, I would always say that, oh, yeah, in Western Australia, I'd always refer to Western Australia as the Disneyland of herbicide resistance because it always seemed that they had everything that was possible. You had multiple resistance and you had glyphosate resistance back when Monsanto, you said that it could never happen and argued that it wasn't real at first, etc. And so that, that's where we have. So anyways, today what I'm going to talk to you is I went back through work that I've done over the last 
decade or two, and I pulled out, I kind of focused on weed control in lentil because that's the, the crop that I've worked most on. I think most of you are probably familiar with lentil here, so I won't have to explain that crop, but it's a tough crop and I'll explain to it why. You know, integrated weed management has been a tough sell, and I won't go through this. And the point I want to make is that integrated weed management has, um, as it's typically been talked about, is a very complex thing. There's all these different ways of control, prevention, physical, cultural, biological, chemical, and within each one of those, there's multiple, multiple methods. So whenever you go out and talk to farmers, it was kind of like you're trying to say, hey, I want your life to be really complicated because I want you to do something that's better. And it's kind of like when you go to the dentist and you know you're getting your teeth cleaned by the hygienist and they're saying, you know, you really should floss more off. You know, you really should do this. You know, a water pick may be a good idea. And you know, I just want to wake up and just brush my teeth, right? I don't want to do all this extra stuff, even though I do know it's probably better. You know, like, so that's, so I can understand why farmers don't want to have all this complexity ad adopt them, especially when weeds aren't there, you know, there's other issues, there's grain markets, weather, you know, all sorts of other, just the logistics of managing a farm are huge. So that's one thing I want to talk about. But let's talk about where I'm going. So the, what, the weed I'm going to focus on well is, on a lot of this is kochia, and kochia, it's, you know, and this is, I'm just talking, I'm giving you the herbicide resistance about circa 2019, Charles Get uh, this information from Charles Geddes. Essentially about 100% of our, our kochia is resistant to, is resistant to uh, IMEs, group Bs, I think you used to call them, or group twos are now. Glyphosate resistance came in, you know, about a bit more than 10 years ago, but it came in and it spread like wildfire. To the point of now that basically you just assume it's glyphosate, most of it's glyphosate resistant as well. It's about 80 to 90% in tested samples. That's always a bias because the tested samples are the samples that people suspect something to be in. So maybe it's not that high, but you can, but because of the no-till system we've selected for it very quickly and the wind dispersal. Kochia is a tumbling dispersal. As about, there's, there's in, in our growth regulators, there's some reasonable levels of resistance, so it's trouble. And there's some reported resistance to PPO inhibitors in group 14, and it has that. Interestingly enough, those of you, I'm sure most of you even know this, I should have maybe left a slide in, that kosher was actually introduced to Western Australia as a forage crop about 20 years ago. And it, uh, I think in about 20 or 30 locations in, in Western Australia, it was established as a salt tolerant forage, quickly realized the mistake, and they actually managed to eradicate that. Whoever did that, I think should be nominated for the equivalent of your Governor General's Medal or something. Whoever like, figured that out and eradicated, because that saved your egg industry literally hundreds of millions of dollars in control headache, headache because that thing. So anyway, we're talking about weed control and lentils. There's a ton of graduate students that have worked and collaborators that have worked on this over the years. I'm, you know, I'm a professor and, you know, my job is to find funds and supervise people and keep everything moving, keep that big machine moving, right? So that's what we're trying to do. We'll start off here. This is lentils. For those of you that haven't ever seen it, this is just a stop motion of them growing over time. And you can see right away some of the challenges of lentils as a crop. You know, these are, there wasn't great emergence in these, but this isn't unlike what you'd get in the, in, uh, in a field where you get holes that sit there in the canopy that sit there a while, they're a short crop. We'll see that in the next slide, slide or there's a couple slides from now. Our two most important weeds in them that have evolved resistance are wild mustard, Brassica caber on the left, and Kochia uh, uh, bassia scoparia. The names changed over time. It used to be the easiest one to remember, Kochia genus and Kochia common name. The taxonomists changed that just to make it hard for undergraduate students, I think. Is one of the first things we did is, is we looked at the critical period of weed control, just to know when do we need to keep this crop weed free to prevent damage. And, and some of you may know it. And the real reason I'm showing this slide is just to show you how short, how short uh, lentil can be compared to the weeds we're dealing with. This is, it's a mixture of weeds in here, but this one's dominated by wild oats. And you can see that once the weeds break through a kosher canopy, it become, they quickly become overtopped. And, and, uh, and once that happens, once you have asymmetric competition happening where one plant is shading out the other, the game is kind of over, right? So the whole thing is about keeping those weeds down early on. We, we, we were trying to figure out the critical period. 
we did that. I won't go through all the details here. We figured out that that kosha that you didn't have to control the weeds till about the five node stage, and that any mo weeds that emerged after the ten node stage, any weeds that emerged later than that, where the crop was big enough that that it that uh, they didn't cause appreciable yield damage. So we figured out that the that the critical period of weed control is between five and ten nodes. So we know that, okay, in kosher you had to do this, uh, that we had to do this. So, so can kosher, around the same time of this, we also, I was, this is the first and only time this has ever happened in my life. A funding body approached me, and this is back probably over 15 years ago. It was back when organic was kind of coming on as a big, as, as not a big, but as a new production scheme, and it looked like it was going to gain a lot of traction. And they said, do you want to do any research on organic weed control? And I said, and I said, yeah, sure. And they said, how about in lentils? I go, oh, lentils. That, you know, you've seen what they can look like when there's no weed control, right? So uh, I kind of hedged my bet and said, well, okay, I'll, I'll do it. But, uh, but I'm, I was very nervous about it because of the, you know, the issue you see here. And I didn't think it actually would work. But we did a simple experiment where we just did a seeding rate experiment. And what we saw in this, the, on the left bottom side here, there's a seeding rate of, lent, of lentil. The red line is, was, the, was the recommended seeding rate under conventional egg. And here is, this is, weed, this is crop and weed biomass here. So we can see we start off, by the time we're getting to approximately the seeding rate, we were, and these were average of foresight years grown on organic land. We were growing about half as much weeds and half as much and half as much crop as we were and that but as we increased our seeding rate we could increase the proportion that was simply having more plants more plants in that space to take up space right so we would essentially have less biomass going to the weeds and more to the crop and that and that held true for the yield it came through in the yield and we did economic analyses on this and we were quite surprised that that actually it did work out okay. And so we still had weeds in there. This is organic. There was no herbicides being used at all. But we we're, in our mind, to kind of demonstrate, hey, lentils is this little crop that has very poor competitive ability, but we can still, through good, through manipulating our agronomy, get some better weed control out of it. And yes, it's not perfect. You can see the plot here. There's still weeds in it and for you know a conventional farmer that would be a write-off but for growing organic that was that was that was pretty darn good so we so we so we were quite happy about it one of the reasons we were able to do this and it wasn't the only re uh, uh, seeding rate wasn't the only thing is we also used in crop mechanical weed control we had a, one of these tine weeding harrows at the time it was an einbach and i i did uh, we had used one because my colleague eric johnson had shown that they worked in uh well, in field peas and lentils, and that you could get up to about you could get up to about 50, 60 percent burial, and that was kind of a sweet spot for weed control and crop tolerance. Any, any further burial, you reduce your yield, and it wasn't wasn't worth it. So he'd shown that. We also started working with a, a, an implement called a mintil rotary hoe. And any of you who were at the the, uh, the herbicide resistance symposium. Remember last time I was here, I, I just done some rotary hoe research. And I had this big long video. It was when YouTube videos were a big thing back in the day. And I showed this video and I'm not gonna show it again, uh, but, uh, but it, it was a lot of fun, anything. But anyway, so these just, these move, well, we'll show you a video, a short video of how these work. And Eric, my colleague Eric Johnson had shown that these worked well in a no-till system. And that was very important because the other mechanical uh, in crop mechanical, like the, the tying weeders did not work in no-till. They would just plug up with uh, residue and, and, not, and, and, and uh, were unusable. So this worked in under no-till and, and there was good tolerance to them. Uh, there's also other methods of uh, in-crop mechanical weed control. Steerable, you know, steerable cultivators for narrow row crops. There's the, you know, the uh, camera activated Gar Garford and there's other several manufacturers in this. And we bought one of these, a manual steered unit, and we had shown with Catherine Stanley, another master's student, that within, and this was in peas, but within the critical period of weed control, that we could use it without a heck of a lot, that we had reasonable crop tolerance about it. We were worried about the crop tolerance because of root pruning, so we had reasonable crop tolerance with it. So, but the question I always had when I was uh, presenting to organic growers 
And people, I would show them, hey, here's your options. You got the, you know, the tine weeders, you have the rotary hoe, or you have the inter-row chillers. And just, people would always come down after, well, which one should I buy? I go, I don't know. It depends. You know, I do the, the academic backpedal and say, well, you know, it depends. And you have to, you know, and you know, instead of just saying, I don't, instead of just saying, I don't know, which, well, I probably just say, I don't know. But, but I tried to guide them a bit. So this prompted this, this uh, study was with uh, uh, Alex Alba, a master student of mine. And we decided to put those three, these three machines, the rotary hoe, which controls weeds when they're very small, just emerging, broadleaf, small seeded weeds, only from the pre-emergent, pre-emergent, well, it's not really pre-emergent, germinated but pre-emergent to early cotyledon stage. There was the, the harrows, which worked at a later stage uh, because you needed, oops, needed to have some crop tolerance for them. And then there was the inter-row tillage, which you had to have the crop up at a big enough stage to actually, for it to be sensed so that you didn't hit the crop row, so that you had to do that. So we looked at those, and this is just some video showing, Alex made some good, uh, some go, strapped a grow pro to implements. And this is the, so this is the in-row, you know, this is in field P, of course, but you can see, of course, tolerance can be an issue because it's pulling out, uh, as you see up at the top, it's pulled out a pea plant. But these actually work mostly not by uprooting, but by actually covering up small weeds. That's what the, at least that's what the European uh, thing. This is the rotary hoe. This is the rotary hoe uh, driving very fast. It's just turned passively. And those tines essentially flick soil out of the ground and do it. And then, the inter and then uh, this is inter-row tillage here, which you can see, which does a beautiful job between the rows, but of course, the weeds in the row doesn't do a darn thing for, right? So that... Yeah, and that one? Uh, yeah, there may, there may... These ones will go, I don't It just may have been where we were in rotation. Yeah, I can't remember the exact situations. But, the, but these ones actually work in stubble quite well, the inter-row tillage. It does work. We have done work in, in stubble. So here's the... Here's the Here's kind of just some simplistic, or some examples. So the rotary hoe, it's getting the weeds when they're just emerging. This is green foxtail here, with, along with some broad leaves. And these are ones that have been flicked out of the ground. The harrowing tends to uproot or cover them. And then the tillage, it makes it look pretty because it blackens it between the row, but it doesn't get the ones within the row. So what do we see? And there's just some more examples. Here's the rotary hoe of what they kind of typically looked like. The rotary hoe, we did, we did this in uh, a factorial with them together as well. That tended to, that's over here with the rotary hoe and the in-row tillage. When we put all three machines together, as we'll see, we had trouble with crop tolerance because we were just heat, beating them up too much. What did we see? We also had seeding rate in this one. We saw that seeding rate helped us reduce our weed biomass. And we also saw that, uh, we also saw that the rotary hoe was better than the inter-row tillage, but not significantly better than the heroin, but that the rotary hoe and the inter-row tillage, although not, you know, these, the, these do have overlapping uh, things, but they, somebody doesn't like what I'm saying, <laughs> but, but they did, in our best treatment on, and this is the average over four site years, reduced our weed biomass by about 76%, uh, which is not bad, right? No herbicides at all, just using mechanical weed control. Uh, in terms of yield, we got a 30% increase in weed yield overall treatments by, at, by seeding at a higher, at double our normal rate. And our other one here gave us about 55% increase in seed yield. So that was very satisfying. You know, we, uh, you know, all in-crop methods worked well. The rotary hoe tended to be the most consistent over sites. I didn't show you that analysis. But the seeding rate increase was also there. So we had it. So the best combinations, you know, and the best, by combining seeding rate with that, that we got that extra boost. So we could get about seed yield increase of about, on average, 70% and weed biomass reduction by 80%. Didn't do anything for perennial weeds, but these were conducted under organic conditions with organic levels of weeds as well, which is really heavy, uh, et cetera. So that's all fine and dandy, and probably most of you are glazed over a bit, oh, organic, whatever, right? So how, how can this plug into a real system? Maybe the question, right? And so one thing we started to look at, and this was with Colleen Redlick. We started to, at the time that she started this, uh, Imi lentils had been released for a few years. And prior to that, lentil growers had been using 
pursuit, which is a mass at the pier, pre-plant as a, it's a group two as well, a, a group two as well as a treatment. So they were well on their way to selecting for herbicide resistance. In fact, even by the time the IMI resistant uh, lentils were released, they probably had several applications of IMIs in there. So there was, uh, there was, so we had the very quick involvement of, of group two resistant uh, uh, wild mustard, as I showed you earlier. So that was a big problem, wild mustard. So we wanted to see if we could use seeding rate to increase the weed control of a herbicide. And so we, in this case, we were using fluthicet methyl, which was uh, named Cadet at the time. It was being looked at as a potential herbicide to be released for lentil control, but it never was. But it had some problems, as many of you herbicide people can see. Here's a bleaching compound. The crop tolerance was pro was even by today's uh, new standards of accepting crop tolerance was probably unacceptable at the levels that you needed to get good weed control. But we wanted to see, could we get additional weed control by increasing the competition of the crop? And so what we did is we planted the lentils at different rates. This is the 140, this is the conventional rate. This is half the conventional rate, double the conventional rate. And we went way higher than we ever thought we would need to be four times, and that's probably you know, would never be done by a thing. But what we wanted is we were testing this as a scientifically, and we wanted to see how that affected the growth, the, the, the dose response of this herbicide. And so we did a typical dose response curve in the field, and we under these different seeding rates, and lo and behold, it worked really nicely. You know, under, at our lowest seeding rate, you can see how much wild mustard biomass, so our intercept was much higher. In addition, in the one year we did this, our LD50 was much higher as well. It took more herbicide to reduce the mustard by, by 50% than it, than it did when you increased the seeding rate. And you can see how it's just pushing that LD50 down, but also pushing down that intercept as well. In the second year, it didn't affect the LD50, but it did push down the, the intercept of that. So we altered, we were able to alter essentially the dose response curve of a herbicide through agronomic means, which and this information was lost to mankind because we titled the paper wrong. And so I think four people have cited it. Uh, you know, we should have, you know, we should, yeah. We, we say, you know, we, we put fluthicet methyl and lentil in the thing. So, but anyways, but we thought it was a, we thought it was kind of cool that you, how you call, how agronomy could affect weed scientists, weed science. Uh, this is also the lentil yield here where we see in the double lentil yield, the green one, kind of our sweet spot of where it was that we're get, having stable yields across a wide range. And uh, at some level, in the second year, the high seeding rate didn't perform well, and the low didn't perform well, but both performed middle. And as you see, as you, as you got too high with the fluthicet methyl, that you started to see the yield drop because of the crop tolerance issue. So we, we thought there was a potential sweet spot in there. The, it was decided that they wouldn't, this wouldn't be released, so this remained as an academic exercise. But nonetheless, we also had another project about replacing herbicides as a, it, 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 with non-herbicide weed control, essentially trying to see if we could reduce herbicide rates and uh, get away with it by adding in rotary hoeing and, uh, and um, higher seeding rates. And so we looked, at the, we looked at that in lentil. This is a bit messy here. This is our seeding rate, our, our normal, double normal, and crazy, crazy high, just to see where this level's off. So this is probably not that applicable. But, uh, but what we can see here, this is our control, just our, sta our standard treatments. What we see here is when we had a full rate of Sencor, where's our full rate of Sencor, was our best one. That having, just using Sen Metribuzin, I should say, I'm not sure what it's called over here, but using just the standard Metribuzin at full rate gave our highest yields, with the exception of the really high lentil seeding rate where our integrated one came in there, which was um, heat and a half rate of Sencor and adding the mechanical weed control into that. But this is probably, this wasn't as profitable this one. I won't show you the data. So that kind of gave us a little bit of data that yes, you can, but you know, you can't, maybe cutting your herbicide too much isn't such a good idea. And here's just some pictures showing this is the, just, just with, just with pre-emerge, no in-crop, uh, the, the, the kind of the base normal treatment, still fairly weedy, 
uh, when we had the, the rotary hoe, it, did, it wasn't good enough to get rid of our wild oats. And that's a problem, wild oats, wild oats germinate from deeper so the rotary hoe doesn't really work on them, so that gave us problems there. And then uh, this is our highest, our, our best weed control. Anyways, uh, these are rates of weed control, and we're basically showing again what I said is that the integrated method, while still giving acceptable weed control, was not nearly as good as our full herbicide one. So does it work? Does, high, does integrated weed management work for herbicide-resistant mustard? Yes, but at very high seed, you need to go to very high seeding rates to get that. And farmers are not usually willing to go for that because of the increased cost and the perceived risk of disease problems, which is another topic completely, and I could get into how, anyways, I won't get into that because I don't have enough time. Um, uh, the increased seeding rate reduced weed biomass regardless of other weed control and soil, but, but also what we've seen now is that soil applied herbicides have been released to control problematic weeds, mixing herbicide groups. And this gets to some more present day research. In fact, I just pulled these figures out of annual reports that we're sending off here. Well, this one's actually done. So this is, we were looking at, uh, I think it's Viraxer, a new herbicide, uh, a, new, a new herbicide, but it, uh, it's, uh, but uh, a tri trifluid, uh, trifluid, what was it, Moxaxin? I can never pronounce herbicide names with the dark. But it is Catherine Aldrich. She was a grad student of myself and Eric Johnson. And she looked at mixtures of these, trying to get uh, the, of, of the of cephalophenicil and uh, previous mentioned herbicide to see if there was any additive effect. She saw a bit, a bit more, a bit of synergistic effect in kosher control. But I guess my point being here is we're starting to get, they're starting, we're similar to Australia, we're seeing much more, uh, much more soil applied herbicides being used to deal with some of these weed problems than before. We've also looked at using rotary hoeing because it's this, because the rotary hoeing, um, I should mention that the rotary hoeing has been adopted somewhat in the organic community, but not at all in the conventional community. I think it's, I think it's because herbicides are still working mostly and uh, they don't need to do it. You know, there's other, other things. They don't need another piece of equipment, even though we've established that, for, that when it's properly timed, you can get excellent, you know, quite good weed control. I wouldn't say excellent, but you've seen those figures, you know, 70 to 80%, you know, 60 to 70% weed control, <coughs> sometimes 80 to 90% weed control. And in fact, so one thing we want, a recent project that myself and Eric Johnson have been looking at is to try to see if the rotary hoeing operation could perhaps, our hypothesis would be, was that the, the soil movement associated with that would, uh, would help the incorporation of some of these soil applied products and perhaps help them work better. And so this is, so this is looking at the kosher data here. Here's our kosher in the check. The HC is the, uh, is the heat complete. So that's sulfofenacil and peroxisulfone. And then this is heat complete plus all of the timings at rotary hoe. So we were rotary hoeing after the herbicide application and in crop. Interestingly enough, we saw a reduction. We saw an increase in kosher here. Uh, the herbicide control plus uh, the in crop rotary hoeing. So just the rotary hoeing when you would normally do it for weed control. And the in crop, interestingly enough, the in crop rotary hoe here, we got as good of weed control as we did as the heat complete, essentially. And our best treatments were these added together, the, the heat complete and, and that, and that. Um, in terms of weed biomass, and, uh, that was the plants per meter squared. In terms of biomass, you see that, uh, that, the, uh, that, uh, that clearly that adding the in-crop rotary, rotary hoeing helped out this herbicide. So I guess the theme here being is that as we are in this era of, of, you know, our standards for herbicide control have dropped, certainly, right? You were not expecting the, 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 the best controls. I think what we're seeing is that, is that these integrated methods can be a bit of a backstop. If I, well, that's not a baseball analogy. Is there a backstop in cricket? I don't think so, right? No. But you, <laughs> anyway, so... <laughs> The fence that's behind, a, well, you guys know what a backstop is, maybe. <laughs> something that keeps something, the safety net. How about that? Everybody knows what a safety net is, that they can do it. So, uh, 
Uh, interestingly enough, the rotary hoe did not increase the herbicide efficiency efficacy. It actually, that earlier rotary hoeing, actually seemed the disturbance with it actually uh, caused more kochia plants to emerge, uh, to emerge. And that's, that was the issue, was that, that that was causing, that that event was causing increased recruitment. So it wasn't, it wasn't so the, any potential benefit from incorporating that herbicide more didn't actually help. Seeding rate, I didn't show you in that graph, it had an overall positive effect again. That's, an, that's one that's, anytime there's weeds there, it's almost always there. Now shifting gears completely, but staying within lentil, we're going to talk about kind of other things that we're doing for lentil weed control that are, and weed control in other crops, but I'm kind of sticking with the lentil for herbicide weed control. And the first one is uh, assessing herbicide damage with UAVs. About seven or eight years ago, I bought a UAV and I started flying it around, doing a little bit of stuff with it. And then suddenly, and then I find, and then our university, I kind of stumbled upon this, people were interested in this thing called phenotyping crops in order, that was gonna feed the world and make, make everything better. And I ended up involved with a large grant to do that. So I got to do cool things with drones and then I've sw since switched mostly to satellites. But one of the things we looked at was because we did, didn't work with weeds is can we, can we assess herbicide damage with UAVs? So we did a simple little project, this is fava bean, and we just, we just essentially threshold, we just essentially segmented out the crop rows and looked at crop tolerance with them. And here was, this is Eric Johnson. Some of you guys may know him. Eric is, of course, the best colleague I've ever had in my life. And uh, he rated them. And Eric's probably rated tens of thousands or more of plots. He's an expert. You know, he can do it really well. And he doesn't cheat. He does it, he does it blind. And he rated them. And these were his ratings for chlorosis. It doesn't matter what herbicides these are here. The main point is how is the error associated with those ratings. When we used a UAV-based system that I've showed you kind of visually what it looked like, we ended up with much better precision. You know, if we look down here, we're seeing that in fact there is a difference between these ones. Is it biologically meaningful? I don't know. But you know, whereas whereas these would kind of get grouped together because of the error in it, clearly the precision of it was better. This led, us to, um, this led us to working with some plant breeders. They've been, you know, the troubles with one of the, one of the um, approaches to managing weeds and lentils is to try to find new, new sources of herbicide resistance in lentils. And the lentil breeder was looking at uh, saflufenicil and increased tolerance to metribuzin. And they were, they were, they were kind of doing it they're plant breeders, right? So they were kind of fooling around with this and they were having a ton of trouble because they were putting out tens of thousands of plots and the spatial variability within the field was much, in the lentils response was much greater than the effect of the herbicide on the weeds. So we came in there and we said, well, we'll help develop as part of this PERC grant, develop a way to assess it. We used the dose response approach. We took two lentil varieties that were that were that that they had identified of having subtle differences in tolerance in tolerance to saflufenicil uh, based on previous work that they had done, not huge differences in tolerance, but this would be a quant uh, a quantitative type of resistance probably. And we looked at it in terms of dose response. Here's the biomass from harvesting the plants, and this is basically from using flying it with a UAV and segmenting this out and just getting the green canopy cover. We, well, we didn't use NDVI here because we had troubles with shadows. We used a different index, but we essentially got the canopy cover in pixels here. And you can see it follows the pattern quite well and was able to track. And so here was a way that you could do it and identify subtle differences. It also shows that one of the main things that was different between these two varieties, they thought it was a difference in tolerance. Well, it, it's debatable whether you could say they're different in tolerance. Essentially, the main difference is whether there was one lentil variety that was much more vigorous than the other lentil variety. So that uh, that was essentially what was happening there. And that was Brianna Zorb just defended that shortly ago. And if I'd been, if I, if I'm more efficient on my sabbatical, I'll finish editing this paper and get it out there. So finally, my last project. This is getting more into the precision egg part, and this is getting into maybe taking a different point of view 
and looking at. The way that harvest weed seed management kind of came into integrated weed management from out in left field, right? You know how it was, okay, we've been trying to do all this stuff, and then harvest weed seed management came in and said, hey, what if we start looking at seed production as a way? You know, and there's been so much good work done here in Western Australia this over the years that maybe here's a, another different way of looking at. When we look at kochia as a weed, this is how kochia, and I know you guys don't got it, and that's a great thing, as I said. So, uh, so but kochia is a weed associated often with saline areas of the field. You can see this area is so saline that there's actually nothing else growing there. It's so saline that it's too saline for the crop. It probably has an EC of six or seven or maybe even higher than 10. Uh, and so there's nothing growing here. So kochia often grows in these saline low areas. And how farmers manage these, how they've typically managed these, is just as they just seed through them and hope for the best and nothing comes up with the kochia, and they go out and spray them, and they spray them again, and maybe, maybe they thought you know, that they, they could come out there and spray them with glyphosate to try to kill the kochia. So here you have this weed growing with no crop competition because it's too saline for the crop, and it's uh, just having a field day, and the only weed control it's getting is her, our herbicides. So you're, and in addition, as it's been shown here, you know, I'll touch it. you have a plant that can evolve herbicide resistance uh, very quickly. It outcrosses and has tumbling dispersal. It's just, a, it's, just a, it's just a disaster waiting to happen. So we decided that, that we proposed this grant and that these saline areas in the fields serve as genetic reservoirs and sources for herbicide-resistant canola. And if we can identify them all, figure out how big they are, and share this information, then we can and farmers know where to find them, and you know, farms are getting bigger. Probably most farmers do know where they are, but we can assess the extent of the problem, and we can look at them. So we want to use, actually, satellite imagery to identify these kochia patches, to classify and map them using satellite imagery and machine learning. So what did we do? Well, the first thing we needed was a ground, was ground reference data. Where is the kochia? So to do that, we initially used a drone. We used this... Uh, we use this uh, Quantix Recon. It's a vertically, it takes off vertically and then turns sideways and flies like an airplane. It looks like an X-wing fighter. It's really cool. Uh, and it can actually, and actually we, you know, most drones are useless at field data, but this Quantix is actually pretty darn good because it can fly, okay, uh, it can fly over 100 hectares in one flight, giving you about giving you about five centimeter or 3.6 3 centimeter ground resolution. So you can get decent resolution on it. They're getting really hard to get though, because these are actually the, well this is actually, well actually ours is called the Quantex Surveyor. This, is, this one's called the Quantex Recon, because it's also sold, sold into, the, into the military market. And since the war in Ukraine, they've all gone to the Ukraine and there's none for sale anywhere, strangely enough. Uh, and so we're hoping we don't crack. We got one spare airframe that we can get some parts off of, so we hope we don't break ours too badly. Our initial study, we looked at 11 fields we surveyed with this. We also went out and manually walked them, annotated where kosher was, or we, man we manually annotated where it looked like kosher was, and we ground truthed that by going out to those fields and confirming, yep, yes, indeed, it was kosher, and not, uh, the other weed you could confuse it with would be foxtail barley. Uh, Foxy barley, hordium jubatum, which kind of grows in saline areas as well. But uh, so then we developed a machine learning model to do this, and we had an accuracy of about 0.85, which is reasonable. We used leave one out field validation, cross validation, so we didn't validate with the data. We were uh, we we when we were validating a field, we left that field's data out of it in order to get better uh, inference with that. Then we had to develop the model, the satellite imagery model. So we used, well, we'll I'll just show you that this here. We used three different machine learning models, three different, and we used some different methods. One of the predominant ones, and I'll show you a bit more, is the multi-year harmonics. You know, probably many of you have seen those, and maybe I should have had one of those GIFs of the green up and green down of the earth. You know, people talk about, it's the lungs of the planet. You know, if you watch David Attenborough and stuff like that, you know, and uh, well, you can track that with satellite imagery, you know, and it gives you this, and it gives you kind of a predictable sine wave, right? 
It may be narrower than the, that if you're in a more northern latitude, but you can kind of track that over time and get an idea of, of when it's greening up. You can also look, there's other ways you can look at the phenology of when the crop or when the vegetation is greening up or not. And, the, and there's other ways. I won't get into the radar sat stuff because I don't have enough time today. Anyway, so if you can, you can look here and see the Landsat 8 harmonic. And as I showed you earlier in those images of kochia, you see kochia can be identified. It's nice in, because in most crops, kochia stays green after the crop is desiccating. So it is still green there. So we thought our hypothesis was that the phenology of it, i.e. getting it at the right time when the kochia was green and the crop wasn't, would help us in the identification of it. Because there are no, people will talk about magical, Spectral signatures that weeds have? No, they don't have. They may have within one field or something, but there's no, there's no definitive spectral signature. The spectral reflectance of most crops is so, and weeds are so similar, you can't tell the difference. Time, or using other methods, is a much better way. So anyways, we fed all this into a machine learning model, put it in, put, put the machine learning model on blend for 30 minutes, and then, uh, <laughs> And then I make jokes about machine learning because everybody does it so much these days that it seems you just put it in the machine learning blender and get the answer out. We did use leave one out field thing. We did this all within the Google Earth engine. This is when I first discovered the Google Earth engine, I can't remember, maybe about five years ago, I, almost, I remember thinking this is the best thing ever because the Google Earth engine is a repository. Those of you that don't know, it's Google has used the power, their now power that they have, that they're still the number one before chat GPT came along. But they have all this power uh, that they went across the globe and scraped all of the remote sen publicly available remote sensing data, brought it in to their location, to one, to their servers, and have it there. And so what you can do is you can do on any piece of land on the planet, you can utilize all of the satellite imagery that's been ever taken, publicly available that's been taken of that imagery and analyze it on Google servers without having to download it. This is crazy good because what it, you, the old way of doing it was you had to go and download these huge images and clip them out and get them into ArcGIS and your computer wasn't big enough so you had to go buy a new computer and that computer still wasn't big enough and then the student actually graduated because they had spent too much time just trying to get the data and now you could get now you can just go there and just do some simple programming in either this is Java here which is their kind of default one but you can use Python as well you can do that and you can do all sorts of things and here you can see we there's even machine learning that we did a random forest a random forest algorithm within this to 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 model this and do it so and identify what variables are important and with there so we used Google Earth Engine to do this it's a little bit hard to see on this this is our UAV ref ground reference map you can see the the greenish areas are the kochia areas in here and here we've overlaid our this would be on 10 meter pixels our predicted map of where the kochia would be and you can see we're doing a pretty good job. We're probably over predicting along this road here, but we're picking up most of the kochia. We have three classes, kochia, other weeds, and crop. We're fine. Here's just another field here, and you can see we're doing a reasonable job of finding. And this is our first run at it. This is like literally, we did this two or three years ago, and we've since we're gotten much better at it by now. But these, I had these slides available, so that's what we got. We ended up with a, you know, a cap of 0.88, and you can see in terms of our, the variables that were important are the amplitude of our NDVI and the harmonic model. Those, those, the harmonic model kind of came out, came out well, and, but also Sentinel-2 imagery. I should say, those of you that don't know satellite, uh, Landsat, the Landsat archive goes back 40 years uh, at 30 meter pixels, uh, but since but since 2016, the Europeans have launched the Sentinel satellites, which have about have a 10 meter uh, pixel size, which is quite good ground resolution for for cropping and stuff like that. So that so our conclusions are that the kochia patches can be mapped. We're scaling this up. We want to scale this up, essentially big enough to do it on all of Western Canada is what our goal is. 
Uh, and you know, with the Earth Engine, you can do it. It's a bit tricky dealing with the size of the data. You have to get into the cloud computing space and buy space on on uh, servers that can that can keep your data because downloading the data will kill you. You can do the processing there, but downloading the results is big. Uh, crop phenology is important. Early season senescence facilitated. It's a challenge with canola, and you can see here, uh, you know, canola stays greener. Uh, canola is also more saline tolerant than most of our crops, so it uh, doesn't have, and, and the herbicide packages in canola traditionally have, have, have killed kochia better, but not recently since glyphosate resistance got in there. Uh, there's also, we also are starting to see more of this, these kind of individual kochia plants growing, and this is obviously in, in, uh, in um, chem fallow. We're starting to see a bit more of that, which worries me that kochia may be changing its ecology a bit, which doesn't surprise me from being this kind of patchy weed associated with it. But anyways, uh, but one, one of the things is that, yeah, uh, yeah, so we're starting to see that through dealing with non-patchy kochia infestations. We want to scale, scale this up, as I said. Uh, we're actually, we've switched from using UAVs to train. We're actually using a fixed wing aircraft with a, it's a camera, it's, it's a, a camera that scans, kind of scans like this as the plane's flying along to image. And that, with that one, we can do tens of thousands of hectares, or thousands of hectares in a single flight. So that, uh, that does four band, just RGB and near infrared. Yeah, which is basically all you need. Yeah, and all, actually it also does thermal because they use it, they use it for, uh, the person who bought it, use it for finding wildlife because they fly it up north in the winter time when the leaves have fallen off the trees looking for moose and caribou to trade to do that well to do uh, surveys for that yeah and so the practical implications is we want to be able to identify areas for patch based control we also it would also be good just to have an idea how big of an area are these kochia patches and finally the other part of this and it's not into this one well we also have a component of this where we're actually we're actually using ec data and using satellite imagery to 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 produce uh, electrical conductivity maps to show salinity. And the one final one is we're looking, and we have, and I didn't have time for this project, is we're using an approach like this to, um, to, uh, to classify the marginality of lands, i.e., are some of these, should, should these areas really ever be farmed? And the answer is probably no, but the answer is always, if they're small and in the middle of the field, can a farmer, is it, is it gonna be worth a farmer not to farm them, you know? So they're probably, be better off. And I know some of our funders are interested in, because these soils tend to be wetter, they tend to be high in nitrogen because of, because of no, low or no crop or weed uptake. And because of that, because of being wetter, they tend to be really high emitters of nitrous oxide. So perhaps, so there's a, an ecological push to do something different with these for global warming considerations and also for rewilding type considerations. And in fact, on my last page, you'll notice there's an insignia from Ducks Unlimited, which probably never, none of you have ever heard of. Ducks Unlimited is a, is a, um, is a, um, it's a lobby and funding group from the United States that gives funding to, to um, well, I, maybe I'll back up. A lot of Americans like to hunt. They like to, they like, ducks are one of the things they like to shoot. The, all, virtually every duck that comes to the United States has laid its eggs and grown up in Canada. So, they're, so if they want more ducks, they put money into ways to keep more wetlands in Canada. So they're viewing this as a potential way. Everybody always likes that one. So there you go. So can we reduce the dependency on herbicides for cropping and lentil? Well, increasing seeding rate is kind of the no-brainer. It reduces weed biomass and increases yield. It also increases the efficacy of herbicides. I think I've shown that fairly conclusively. Um, has there been uptake of that? A little bit, but there's this fear. Producers have a real fear of increasing, of changing what works for them, right? Uh, that timely in-crop rotary hoeing reduces weed biomass. It can also improve herbicide control in some cases. It's another, another method in that toolbox. Have conventional producers done it? No, not at all. Uh, in the organic industry, you know, it's small, but there's quite a few rotary hoes out there. 
Um, herbicides can work well. You know, I've got a list there. You know, there's new products on the market all the time. We're pitting complexity against simplicity. So I think our challenge, and I know I've had some discussions here already, that, that we have to sell integrated weed management as, as being a simple system, not a complex system. And you know, I think good agronomy, and the overall message that good agronomy can reduce our reliance on herbicides. I always like to tell students that good agronomy is good weed control. You know, having a crop canopy that fills in quick and doesn't leave room for, new, for newly emerged weeds will help your herbicides work and work well there. That, this is who funds all my, oh, I don't have DU on this one. Oh, darn, uh, I don't have Ducks Unlimited on this one. This is some of the people that help fund my research and uh, I think I've kept it within a reasonable amount of time there, hopefully. 